Back in late October 2023, I had a few people start to ask me if I'd seen or heard the Friendly Geordies podcast, were apparently ripped into me for a, an hour and a half. Oh, you did indeed. At the time, the truth was, no, I hadn't. But recently, I sat down to try and get through it. Look, I tried, okay? I really tried. <laughs> I pulled 95% of the stuff that makes up this video together back in November last year, but then I sat on it. To be honest, I just didn't have the energy back then to respond. Friendly Geordies has a fairly large cult-like following from what I've seen, and when he says something, people listen, and many of those people take it as gospel. They don't really bother to question anything. Nothing that he says, anyway. Given all that, I'd toyed with the idea of just ignoring it and not responding. I mean, that was the easy option. But then again, I was accused of being dishonest, among other things. Dude, just admit you're an ape like everyone else. And this guy- See you next Tuesday. ...down here is saying, oh, either he is being unbelievably dishonest or he just doesn't understand how Parliament works. Your premises so far are just based on assumption and deliberately misleading your audience to thinking that, that really just do not understand how politics works at all, let alone how the parliamentary system works. Wanton, wanton lies. It's like, it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. So let's get into it. I'm not going to be going through each and every one of the opinions he expressed over the hour and a half. For one, that'd take way too long. And two, I honestly didn't get through the whole thing. After about 30 minutes or so, I felt like it was a genuine waste of time and energy, so I kind of just skipped through sections from there. What I will do is address a few, uh, let's be overly generous and call them inaccuracies that were presented. These are the things that obviously resonated with his fans, given the times I've seen his talking points regurgitated as fact. Look, if there is a legitimate point I missed that you'd like me to address, leave a comment and I might take a look, preferably with a time code though to save me some hassle. I think it should be pretty clear, but I'm not perfect and I've never claimed to be. But what I can say is that when I put something out, I've done the work. <sighs> Swollen pickles. I thought it was your Money. fan. I remember. S Why would you think that? May as well address this because I know a few have wondered whether I am or have ever been a fan of Friendly Geordies. The short answer is no. Not that I mean that in a mean way. I've just never been a regular viewer. I'm guessing like a lot of people I watched a bit of the Barilaro drama when that was going on but outside of that prior to pulling this video together the only time I've ever really watched his stuff is if someone's pinged me a link or people have prompted me to go and have a look at something. His Housing Australia Future Fund video is the perfect example. Because I remember this name Swollen Pickles from our podcast comments section in 2018, 2017. Yeah. So he, I think he was a fan of you and even the pod, and now he's gone to the dark side. <laughs> Okay, so this just isn't true. I'm not sure where he's getting that from. I'd never listened to the podcast prior to this episode and never left any comments. Does he does he support any party or he's just like... No, he's one of those people that like clearly votes Greens but says that he's above it and he's looking at everything objectively and with facts and the facts just lead to the Greens. It's like, dude, just admit you're an ape like everyone else and you have your little monkey brain that thinks away. Okay, just come out and admit it. Like, have the balls to admit that you're a Greens voter, for fuck's sake. This may have made it easier for him if it were true, but unfortunately, it's not. I don't think there's anything wrong with that! <laughs> Jordan seems to make the same assumption that most of the rusted on Labor faithful seem to have made about me any time I criticise the Labor government. I do get it. For him and his audience, it's probably the quickest and easiest way to dismiss any criticism of the current government. This Pickles guy, he thinks this Labour policy is rubbish. He must be some dirty Greens voter, or maybe even some Greens sleeper agent. It's pretty lazy, but it's not that complicated. In my view, Labour's centrepiece the Housing Australia Future Fund policy is a turd sandwich. It's that simple. That doesn't mean I'm affiliated with the Greens in any way, or that I'm some sort of habitual Greens voter. I've never explicitly said who I voted for in the past, partly because I didn't think it was anyone's business, and partly because I like to keep people guessing. When the Coalition were in government and I criticised them, I was getting called a Labour shill all the time. Now that Labour are in government, when I criticise them, I'm called a Greens shill. What would I be called in the unlikely event that the Greens ever found themselves in power, and I inevitably, inevitably, criticise them. 
Who would I be shilling for then? This guy? This one maybe? Two-party system! Yeah, true. It's probably not something I'm ever going to have to worry about. I've said this countless times before, but just in case you've missed it, I don't follow politics as if it were a team sport. It's not for me. People change. Their values change. If you attach yourself to a political party like a barnacle, sooner or later you're going to have to either compromise your own values, choose to look the other way, ignore things, or charge out to defend the indefensible. But just so I'm crystal clear here, I'm not a habitual Greens voter. I'm not some sort of Greens sleeper agent. I've never taken money from a political party or affiliate. I've never sought out deals from political parties or affiliates. I've never volunteered or worked for any political party or affiliate. And I'm not a member of any political party. If you can't understand it and accept that, then really that's on you. Maybe... Like, what? Well, maybe he supports Labour in... He's a truth seeker. Yeah, he's a truth seeker. That, that's how he uh, advertises himself and that's how his entire audience see themselves. I don't advertise myself at all. I'm not running a business here. I'm one guy doing this in my spare time. Can we get on with this, please? All right, let's hear but, it. Uh, sorry, sorry. Just before we continue on this point, you know why he thinks that only 5% of it was addressing the half? Because it was. Because he doesn't have an argument well, to 95%. big, big arguments that I put in it. Well, let's see what the kid has. Well, hang on. Let me just let me just point out two major ones that I remember because this was ages ago. So I won't have the facts and figures in front of me entirely, but they'll be like you know around the ballpark. But you know, just compl like all Greens voters do, they do this every time. They just say you don't have any um, opinion. All you did was do funny voices, which I'm currently doing now. And um, so uh, you you did not you don't have any facts. But it's just like, dude, all they do is they just ignore the arguments that they don't have an argument to and then pretend that that argument didn't happen. Because again, they just live in fantasy world. So two of these massive examples being, first one doesn't address at all that we are currently in a huge labor shortage, massive. I think it's like half a million people or something like that. Like to get, put, keep up with the demand of the things that are slated to be built now, you would need half a million more people in the building and construction industry. Uh, so no answer to that. No answer to the material shortage that has made build time like a third longer. No answer to that at all. Just you can magically appear houses. Well, let's let's uh, hear, let's hear his arguments before we rubbish him. Right. So his two big arguments were labour shortages and material shortages. Gotcha. Those were his two ninety-five big big arguments that I put in it. Okay, fair enough. Now, at first I thought I missed the two big, big arguments he presented in his video. His original video did run for 65 minutes, remember, so he obviously had plenty of time to cover his two big, big arguments that I put in it. So how long did he spend talking about his two big, big arguments in that 65 minute video? 14 seconds. Here they are. Houses on your own street that got approval two years ago still haven't started construction as we're in the middle of a chronic labour shortage of about half a million people. We're also in the thick of a material shortage that has made construction time, not approval time, just construction time, go up by a third. Now you'll have to forgive me for not covering his two big, big arguments. Previously, I'm not sure why I didn't realise that those 14 seconds hidden away halfway through were the big ticket items. <laughs> I'll be blunt, it seems pretty sketchy to me to suggest that I'm ignoring his big arguments when they accounted for a solid 14 seconds of a 65 minute video, don't you think? Anyway, let's set that aside for a moment. What are these arguments for exactly? Since I don't want to be accused of deliberately ignoring Jordan's two big, big arguments, let's take a look at them. Houses on your own street that got approval two years ago still haven't started construction, as we're in the middle of a chronic labour shortage of about half a million people. The first thing you may have noticed there is how he chose to highlight the start and end of this sentence, skipping over a little bit in the middle. Let's read the sentence together. Master Builders Australia estimates an immediate shortage of 80,000 tradespeople in construction overall. Yeah, it's a lot of people, but it's also a long way off the half a million figure Jordan preferred to use. As we're in the middle of a chronic labour shortage of about half a million people. So the first thing to say is that suggesting that we're in the middle of a labour shortage in the construction industry of half a million people is misleading at best. Let's read the remainder of the sentence. With more than 470,000 needed to enter the industry in the next five years to meet demand. First up, I think it's worth acknowledging that Master Builders Australia say a lot of things because they are essentially a lobby group for the building industry. 
The second thing is that the figures referred to here seem to be an amalgam of talking points the NBA were running throughout the second half of 2022. Here's the NBA's CEO, Danita Warren, in one of her many appearances on Sky News. Can you describe just how short are we in workers in the industry right now? Thank you and good afternoon. Well, we're very short. Uh, we're estimating that the immediate need is around about 70 odd thousand workers, but in the longer term, over five years, it could be as high as 500,000 workers as we see retirements and people moving other industries and so forth. The MBA went on to refine these estimates in a report they published in April 2023. So let's take a look at the detail of how they landed on those figures. So what does the MBA's figure represent? It's the number of people that need to come into the industry to replace workers that are leaving the industry, for example retiring, on top of those that are needed to meet growth projections through to the end of 2026. According to the data presented by the MBA, there are, at the time of the report in April 2023, approximately 1.32 million workers in the construction industry. The data used by the MBA suggests that approximately 7.8% of the construction workforce leave the industry each year due to totally normal stuff like people retiring or picking up jobs in other industries. Based on those figures, just over 100,000 workers leave the construction industry each year. The MBA also used Jobs and Skills Australia data that suggested the industry will grow by 5.8% by 2026. So what the MBA were actually saying was that in order to cover natural attrition as well as projected industry growth, almost half a million people will need to start work in the industry over the next five years. People enter and exit the workforce all the time. It's normal. They are not saying that there's a shortage of half a million workers right now. The most recent data from the Federal Government's Labor Market Insights website shows that there has been growth in the construction workforce since the peak of the pandemic. In fact, the workforce grew by around 146,000 in the most recent 12-month period available. In theory, if the industry were to maintain that annually, they'd go a long way to covering off natural attrition plus industry growth. Look, I am in no way suggesting that there hasn't been a skills shortage in this country. What I am suggesting, though, is that Jordan appears to have well oversold the extent of it. Why? Who knows? So yeah, Australia has experienced a well-documented skills shortage in recent years, which has no doubt been amplified thanks to the pandemic, as a lot of problems have been. But the reality is, a labour shortage in construction is not a problem that's just sprung up overnight. It's been an issue the country has had for quite some time through successive labour and coalition governments. In the present day, Infrastructure Australia have forecast a deficit of 131,000 trades and labourers in 2024, which certainly doesn't sound great. But should we just accept that nothing can be done to help solve a problem like that? Of course not, we just need a government willing to step in and take action. Everyone knows that the government increased migration significantly in recent years to address the downturn in migration we saw as a result of the pandemic. While it may well have helped the country avoid a recession, the surge has also unironically put pressure on demand for housing and rentals. You're probably wondering what this has to do with labour shortages in the construction industry. Well, this is where it gets interesting. Despite the surge in migration and despite the skill shortage in trades needed to build homes, the government made a decision to exclude highly paid trades from the specialist skills migration pathway announced in December 2023. Claire O'Neill was quick to say that the government's migration plan wouldn't make it harder to bring tradespeople to Australia, which is true, it won't make it harder. But it's also true that the government's migration plan won't make it easier to bring tradespeople to the country either. And let's be honest, it doesn't sound all that easy at the moment. This quote from O'Neill was interesting. The government feels that for sectors like trades, you should have to prove that there is a skills shortage before you start to recruit overseas. I'm sorry, is there a skills shortage or not? Why wouldn't the government take the opportunity to make it easier to bring skilled tradespeople to the country? Particularly while we're in the middle of a housing crisis that we're told can only be solved by building more homes. Seems really weird, doesn't it? Adding to the problem further are the various state and federal government's major infrastructure projects. Trades that would once have been building homes are being poached by major infrastructure projects thanks to the allure of higher pay. Not something you can blame workers for, but it is a byproduct of government decision making. Sooner or later, governments across the country may need to start making some tough decisions. Either build another tunnel or build more homes. For what it's worth, there is HIA data that suggests the worst of the skills shortage, at least for now, might be behind us but you'd be best to approach these figures with caution as because the numbers could also point toward a slowdown in work started as much as they do anything else. The point here is this. There are levers the government could explore pulling to help ease the skills shortage. Whether or not the various unions, 
<coughs> Labor's major donors. <coughs> Would be happy for the government to pull those levers is another matter. We're also in the thick of a material shortage that has made construction time, not approval time, just construction time, go up by a third. Yes, there have been well documented supply chain issues that have bumped up the cost of building materials in recent years. But the first thing I noticed here though was that this article was from a building company's website. It didn't link to the original data source and it didn't have a published date, which rang some alarm bells. So it turns out it is a couple of years old, but I found the report that the numbers in this article came from. The HOA did a survey in February, March 2022 of 306 people across across all sectors of the industry, mostly from Victoria and New South Wales. And that's where these numbers came from. There's no doubt that peak pandemic meant that it took longer to build stuff. That should really just be a no-brainer. Fortunately though, since 2022, we may have started to turn the corner. CoreLogic reported that 2023 saw the costs associated with building stabilise. In mid-2023, the HIA reported that some material costs had actually begun to decline. In July 2023, the HIA also reported that price inflation on building materials was back to pre-pandemic rates. Maybe it's a bit too early to blow the trumpet, but things seem to be tracking in the right direction. So getting back to Jordan, what were these arguments for exactly? Is a labour shortage an argument for why we should all be grateful and accept a piss-weak centrepiece housing policy? A supply chain issue is an argument for why the HAWF is a visionary, visionary housing policy? Or maybe the argument is that we shouldn't invest more in social and affordable housing because there's a labour shortage at the moment. I don't know, are we expecting that problem to just fix itself? To me, his two arguments sounded more like excuses for why we should accept the bare minimum more than anything else. And that in turn does nothing more than make the guy sound like a labour apologist. His two big, big arguments aren't arguments for anything. They are just evidence that the housing problem is bigger and more complex than anything the HAWF will be able to deal with. They're evidence that the bare minimum approach to solving this problem isn't going to cut it. I mean, we could talk about the demand side, skyrocketing rents, and the impact they're having on driving demand for social housing. We could talk about how the cost of rent is outpacing wage growth. We could talk about why the Productivity Commissioner has said that the private rental market is the epicentre of the affordability problem. and what was driving demand for social housing and homelessness services. If you want to get an insight into the rental market, check out Purple Pingers. There's some real grim stuff there, but I think I'm getting off track. So with that, I've probably given this more than the 14 seconds deserved, quite frankly. So let's move on. But that's what I'm saying. He didn't and he also, have an argument to that argument. He also makes funny voices. No, he gets Oh, that's the his office. actual voice? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just fucking around, swollen pickles. Yeah, no, it's a very normal voice. No, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, lads. It's okay. I hate the sound of my voice too, which is kind of unlucky given that I've got the perfect head for radio. <laughs> like, it's just the worst assumptions imaginable. It's, it's like, come on, anyone studying economics or finance or anything, come on, just write out in the comments. Like, this is a ridiculous assumption world, right? Like, this is just basically saying... Say they put in $10 billion and it only gets a $1 return. Just, just, so, just so we can see how I could be right. From what I can tell, Jordan and his mate spend a good slab of time attempting to rip into me because of the hypothetical I used in the original video relied on some assumptions. Let's have a grown-up talk for a sec. Sometimes, in the absence of detail and transparency, assumptions are necessary. It would have been lovely had the government clearly and openly articulated exactly how the half would work from a funding and fund management perspective when they released the exposure draft and subsequently tabled the bill in Parliament. But they didn't. They could have included the proposed investment mandate in the consultation process to remove any need for assumptions, but they didn't. They could have outlined how the debt would be managed during the consultation process or included it in the explanatory memorandum, but they didn't. The absence of all this detail meant anyone attempting to scrutinise the half was forced to fill in the gaps to make some educated assumptions. Transparency would have been nice, but unfortunately transparency appears to be one of those words political parties only seem to use when they're in opposition. Anyway, they went on and on. Why are you assuming that the government is borrowing money for this? Why? They didn't for the future. The, the fund that you are using right now, they did not borrow money for. Uh, for the future fund, they didn't borrow money. I don't think that they borrowed money for the other two smaller funds either. 
Why are they borrowing money for this one? There's more. The 10 billion we started with, remember that's borrowed money. It's a more boring context. No, it's it not. You don't know that. Note that. Let's address this one first because it's pretty quick and easy to dispel. Why did I think the government was borrowing to stump up the $10 billion for the Housing Australia Future Fund? Because it's exactly what the government told us they would do. The fact that the half would be set up with borrowed money should not have been a surprise to anyone paying attention. Maybe you missed the initial announcement way back in 2021 when Labor, then in opposition, were very clear that the Housing Australia Future Fund would be set up as an off-budget vehicle. In other words, not funded via the budget. Granted, the references to borrowed money were a little vague in the explanatory memorandum, but the statement, the initial credit to the half would have no impact on the underlying cash and fiscal balance, could really only mean one of two things, either a loan or someone's picking a bunch of cash from the magical money tree. Maybe you missed the references to the government having to borrow $10 billion to set up the fund almost every single time the half was mentioned in the media. Maybe you missed the Secretary of the Department of Finance clarifying that the initial $10 billion will be borrowed by the federal government. There's a solid line in the half's bill digest that I think's worth reading. There's no question the $10 billion will increase gross debt, with the Secretary of the Department of Finance confirming the initial $10 billion will be borrowed by the Commonwealth. So just to make it very clear, the Department of Finance confirmed that the $10 billion needed to set up the half would be borrowed. There's no assumption there, no ambiguity, the $10 billion was borrowed by the government. Once you're able to come to terms with that fact and accept it, one of the reasons why the half is a terrible centerpiece policy should quickly become apparent. So they're <laughs> just using it from their fiscal budget, like whatever savings the government has, they're using that for the fund? Dude, it's just not specified. It's just like he is making this assumption. I'm, I'm guessing he's just going to be using interest. I'll see in a sec. But I think he's using interest from assuming that they're borrowing money for the fund. Jeez, he could have saved me a lot of time by just admitting that he didn't know where the money was coming from at the start. Just in case you're still not clear on how it was designed to work, let's go again. Actually, nah. Let's listen to the Department of Finance explain it with Katie Gallagher riding shotgun. So the Housing Australia Future Fund is a commitment whereby the government has uh, invested $10 billion, taken $10 billion and provided that to the Future Fund. Borrowed. Sorry, borrowed $10 billion uh, and provided that to the Future Fund who then invest that money. Mm -hmm. That money is invested by the Future Fund. They have been invest It has been invested in order to generate the return that the government um, on average wishes to get from that investment in order to support the disbursements from the housing the, the disbursements the housing disbursements uh, through housing australia uh, and the grants which are associated and with that policy that's... borrow 10 billion dollars borrow 10 billion dollars borrow 10 billion dollars borrow 10 billion dollars as i said not all funds are created equal and this table this refers to the future fund itself which is worth 200 billion dollars yep. and has an investment mandate to deliver a return of cpi plus an additional four to five percent over the long term the mm. equivalent equity interesting that he doesn't mention that their future fund, I think, started with $60 billion. It's now worth $200 billion or something there around. In, I think, 16 years. And this... See you next Tuesday. ...down here is saying, oh, but sometimes they lose money. Yeah, that future fund did lose money sometimes. It's now worth $200 billion. Yeah. What he doesn't mention, what he conveniently leaves out. So yeah, what Jordan doesn't mention and what he conveniently leaves out whenever he keeps pointing toward the future fund is that the future fund is the last of the funds that you actually want to point to when you're discussing the HAWF. I've said this before, the HAWF is not the future fund. The future fund is a sovereign wealth fund, a long-term investment that exists for future generations. The Future Fund was not set up with borrowed money, it was initially created using government surplus and proceeds from the sale of one third of Telstra. The last I heard, the Future Fund hasn't actually dispersed a cent yet either. By its nature, it can afford to ride the ups and downs of investment markets to target higher returns over the longer term. The HAWF, on the other hand, has been set up with borrowed money and it also needs to pay out almost immediately in the form of its annual disbursements. It needs to start paying out in its first 12 months. That means taking a lower risk strategy. In less than 12 months time now, the HAWF will disperse 5% of its initial investment. It can't afford to roll a higher risk dice. 
Anyone that was looking at the HAFF with a remotely critical lens could see that pretty exposure, which you can think of as a de facto measure of how much risk the fund is taking on, was 59 as at the 30th of June 2022. Don't the smaller pretend you funds know what that, that the future Somebody's cranky. fund board manage, however, have investment mandates that tend to take on a lower risk profile and therefore achieve smaller returns. The Medical Research Future Fund is a prime example. Its investment mandate is to deliver a return of the RBA cash rate plus 1.5 to 2% per annum. Its equivalent equity exposure as at the 30th of June 2022 was 30, so about half that of the main future fund. Mm. Now that might all sound boring, uh, context often is, but oh, we should all so be good. clear now that not all of these funds are created equally. We can accept that right. I've done I'll just pause here for a second. The point I was attempting to make here, which is a point that Jordan appears too cranky to have actually absorbed is that not all funds managed by the future fund are created equal. They all take on different risk profiles and therefore have different investment mandates. It was back then and still is today a statement of fact that the smaller funds managed by the future fund take a more conservative approach to risk compared to the main future fund. Taking on less risk generally means smaller returns. The point was don't be like Jordan and point to the main future fund and expect the HAFF to see returns and growth like that, because the main future fund and the HAFF are not the same. You're not a king, dude. I've done this before, but let's compare the proposed HAFF with the Medical Research Future Fund. The MRFF is far closer in scale to the HAFF and nowhere near the scale of the Big Puppy Future Fund. They're Okay, so your logic is, holy shit, Jesus, fuck, dude, the universe these people have to retreat to to make themselves right. His argument here is that the medical research fund is $20 billion, and that's closer to $10 billion. Therefore, they're going to choose an investment strategy that is closer to the medical research fund, just because it's closer somehow. That's his logic. Why not go with the drought fund? Why not go with the indigenous fund? Why not go with the disability insurance fund? Why not go with those ones? Why are you going with that one? Look, it's because it has a very small, safe return. That's why he's using this one. That's why he's using it. Nope. That's not why I used it. A lot of people, Jordan and his wingman included, focused on the fact that I used the Medical Research Future Fund as the baseline for my first comparison. To be fair, there are a few people that commented on my original video that took issue with that as well. Now, there are a few reasons why I used the MRFF, which I tried to touch on in the original video, and one prior, I think. None of the reasons were as Machiavellian as people may want to believe, though. Remember assumptions? Well, funnily enough, the PBO regularly referred to the Medical Research Future Fund and the Emergency Response Fund throughout their costing report, with those two funds forming the basis of the majority of the assumptions the PBO used when providing their report. Of the two funds that the PBO had used as the baseline for their analysis, I used the MRFF in my original video because it had been around longer than the ERF. At the time of pulling together the original video, there was not even three years worth of returns data available for the ERF. The MRFF, on the other hand, had been around long enough to have weathered some of the ups and downs of the stock market. The MRFF also makes annual disbursements although the value of those are decided each year by the Future Fund Board. Ultimately though, whether I'd run with the MRFF or the ERF, it wasn't going to make a hell of a lot of difference. The end result was always going to be within the same ballpark. It's kind of funny that someone would take issue with me using the MRFF as the baseline when Jordan seemed to be quite happy to repeatedly point to the Future Fund itself and its return when he was discussing the half. The big future fund is the last fund you'd want to point to in comparison to the HAF if your intention is to actually provide genuine analysis. The HAF was never going to have an investment mandate comparable with the big future fund. That much was obvious. If a simple ape like myself could see it, not sure how Jordan missed it. For what it's worth though, I'm not the only one asking questions about how well the HAF stacks up. A couple of weeks after the initial video, Michael West Media published an article from Harry Chimay looking at the HAF. Pretty happy to see that he'd also logically worked through the information available at the time and landed on the MRFF as a suitable proxy for the HAF in his analysis as well. You can find Harry's original article here. It's well worth a read. As an aside, when the results for the financial year 2022 to 2023 were published, I did another follow-up video looking at all the child funds. It wasn't all that surprising to find that there was not a lot of difference between the smaller funds in terms of their performance last year. 
Do you know what the MRFF returned last year? 4.4% and the ERF? 4.6%. So the reality is whatever smaller fund I'd chosen to use for my example, the end result was going to be very similar. But all this talk of how stupid I am for picking the MRFF is really just a mute point. Why? Because now the half is underway, we don't need to make any assumptions about the investment mandate because they've finally been published. And shock horror, the half's investment mandate is far closer to the MRFF than it is to the big future fund. The Future Fund Board has been given an investment mandate for the half to deliver an average return of 2-3% plus CPI each year. That's the rate that I'd used in a follow-up video to the one that was discussed on this podcast. So if the half had started on the 1st of July 2022 based on funds with an identical investment mandate, you can expect that it would have delivered a return of between 45 and 4.7%. Here's a bonus fact. The Parliamentary Library have compared existing funds and have said that the Housing Australia Future Fund could be expected to not meet or exceed its benchmark return up to 43% of the time. In terms of the loan itself, I touched on this in the original video. In years gone by, there have been times where the government has been able to borrow at a ridiculously low interest rate. But that's not today though. It was 4.8% on the 1st of November, the day that the half was established. Michael Pascoe pointed out way back in February 2023 that even before disbursement, the half was going to need to generate a 4% return just to break even. How the government serviced the debt, for now at least, remains one of life's great mysteries. What's not a mystery though is that the Commonwealth will be paying interest on their $10 billion loan. The lack of transparency around how the $10 billion loan would be managed didn't go unnoticed though. The Housing Australia Future Fund Bill Digest pointed out it's unclear why a public debt interest costing or offsetting net investment return is excluded from the explanatory memorandum. I'll leave it to you to speculate as to why that information may not have been included. Fund management fees. Again, some people took issue with the 1.6% cost figure I applied. I thought I was pretty clear with it, but the 1.6% was based on a three-year average of direct and look-through costs. In his example, Harry Chamay applied a similar principle but rounded up to 2%. Those fees, there's another $160 million coming out of the pot. So now the fund is worth $9.55 billion. Except, this is incredible, if he read the same report, because I have read that report, if he read that same report, he would know that the profit that they are projecting from the fund that he's talking about there and all the other funds, the profit that they're projecting about like the 4.1% return and shit, that is the profit after that money has been taken out. So he's just making it like, okay, 160, in his bizarre world, like let's, it's probably not even going to be close to $160 million. I'd really have to see how he got to that number. But let's just... Let's just assume that it is $160 million. That $160 million has already been taken out. And yet he's taking it out again. All right, let's take a deep breath and look at this calmly. I think what Jordan is saying is that I was factoring in investment fees and costs associated with managing the fund twice because they'd have already been taken out of the return. He's also saying he's read the 2021-22 Future Fund Annual Report, which is a cracking read. Anyway, I'll quickly walk through why I don't believe fees and costs were double counted. In the example I'd used, I'd taken the percentage return on investment since the start of the MRFF and the average percentage of direct and look-through costs for the most recent three-year period. From what I understand, when the fund and the Department of Finance report on dollar figures, they are reporting net of costs. In other words, fees and costs have already been taken out. When they refer to a percentage return though, they're referring to nominal returns. It's not particularly well labelled, but you can see it here. Unless there's some trickery going on here, the standard definition of a nominal return is that a nominal return on an investment is the return before factoring in expenses such as taxes, investment fees and costs. In other words, investment fees or costs haven't been factored into this figure. Look, there's always a chance that I'm wrong, but that's the logic that I applied, which made sense to me. Regardless, I think this just highlights the real mistake I made here, which was unnecessarily complicating things with an example in the first place, which is my bad. I could have made the point a lot simpler, which I'll try to do now. Whichever way you try and cut it though, the half just doesn't really stack up. Honestly, I think I've done this whole section to death. Perhaps the mistake I made in the initial video was overcomplicating things, so let's summarise this as simply as possible. The government borrowed $10 billion at an interest rate of 4.8%. They handed over that $10 billion to the Future Fund for them to invest and manage on the government's behalf. 
there are costs associated with that in the order of 1.6%. The government has also committed to dispersing $500 million from the fund each year. That represents 5% of the initial capital. You can see the problem, right? Essentially, it means the government's going to spend a nudge over $600 million in order to disperse $500 million to Housing Australia. Now that's value for money. The half is going to have to perform out of its skin for the government to actually break even. They are trying to distract from the fact that everything that the Future Fund has touched has gone up. All of them have gone up massively, which means that they are dispersing more money into their selected fields. And this is the thing. They are up and they are dispersing money. And he's just pretending like this fund, for some weird reason, because fund managers, for whatever reason, don't want the bonuses on this and just want the fund to fail so that they can advertise, wow, we lost a billion dollars, invest with us. Uh, he's assuming this one is going to lose a billion dollars in two years off of, like, just obscene, stupid points. Yeah, except that's not entirely true, is it? The Future Fund, which has grown significantly since 2006, has not dispersed a cent. Combine that fact along with the fact that it has the most aggressive investment mandate of all the funds and it's pretty obvious why comparing the half to the Future Fund is just stupid. And, um, awkward quick reminder, that's exactly what Jordan was doing. A lot. Look everyone, look! The fund they're basing it off went down this year. Just ignore the couple of decades it consistently went up. Even if the fund underperforms its average of 7.8%, there's still a very good chance that the fund will offset itself within the first two years. The smaller funds, the ones comparable to the half, the ones that are actually dispersing funds, they haven't grown massively. No, they haven't. All of them have gone up massively. The Disaster Ready Fund, formerly known as the ERF, started with approximately $4 billion. Its investment mandate is identical to the half. It began in December 2019. It's now sitting on $4.45 billion. That's great, but it didn't start dispersing until the start of the 2020-2021 financial year. And then it only distributed $50 million, or 1.25% of its initial capital, in that first year. In the two most recent financial years, the fund has dispersed $200 million each year, or 5% of the initial capital. The fund has also started to go backwards since they started to do that. Oh, and the government didn't borrow any money to set this one up. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land and Sea Future Fund started in February 2019. Its investment mandate is identical to the half. Five years later, it's sitting on $2.078 billion. On average, it disperses around $55 million per year, or approximately 2.7% of the initial capital. And no, the government didn't borrow to set this one up. The crowd favourite, the Medical Research Future Fund, was credited with $20 billion, and it's now on just under $22 billion. It's had a respectable increase, which sounds great, until you realise that the most the MRFF has dispersed in a year is $598 million, which is just 3% of the $20 billion it started with. The average amount dispersed over the first seven years of the fund is approximately $325 million per year, or 1.6% of the initial capital. And no, the government didn't borrow to set this one up. So what do we take away from this? Well, the smaller funds, those with more conservative investment mandates, the ones that are actually dispersing funds annually, they're not seeing massive growth. It's really odd, isn't it, that when you don't invest as aggressively and you regularly withdraw money from the fund, it just doesn't grow as fast. Strange. What we can also take away from this is that none of these funds are regularly withdrawing anywhere near as much in percentage terms per year as what the half will. Why not go with the Disability Insurance Fund? The Disability Care Australia Fund is not sitting on $16 billion due to the returns on investments. Its returns have been modest at best. If I'd wanted to pick the worst performing fund and use that as my baseline, this would have been the one to pick. Thanks to the increase to the Medicare levy, the Disability Care Australia Fund has been credited with almost $39 billion since 2014. It's dispersed almost $24 billion. It has grown, but not because of its return on investment. It's grown because money has regularly been credited to it. The other thing as well is the fact that all these people are always arguing. This was such a stupid argument from Greens voters. It's like they assume that everyone does things for free. Nah. I mean, I can't speak for Greens voters, but my baseline is to assume that very little in life is free. 
When the government borrowed the $10 billion, for example, that wasn't free money. There's a nominal 4.8% interest rate attached to that. When the government gave that $10 billion to the Future Fund to manage on their behalf, that wasn't free either. The Future Fund will charge fund management fees and pass on costs associated with that. I'm sure there'll be costs associated with ours in Australia administering the half too. Nah, nothing's free. Well, so isn't his argument that um, the minister will have the prerogative of uh, deciding where the funds go? Yeah. Even in the future. Yeah. So could you make an argument that if there was a coalition government in the future, they'll misdirect those funds and would we'll, we'll put it into housing? No, because it has to go into f- the, 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 the housing. Like, the worst thing... But what if it's like, it's for housing, so hence, directed to my house? Yeah, they can do that shit. But that's still building a fucking house, <laughs> you know? Like, this is the whole thing. And, and that's like a cartoonish version. Oh, I'm going to put all... $500 million into my house. No, they'll put it into housing in their electorates or something like that, you know? And it'll be for social and affordable housing, which will be the mandate. And that is still better than nothing. Oh, boy. Thanks for the lesson on when pork barreling is okay, I guess. By this logic, sports rorts and car park rorts were absolutely fine then, weren't they? The money was still allocated to sports and car parks. This is, of course, without even going into the fact that the government elected not to define what they meant by social and affordable housing within the HAWF bill, giving themselves all sorts of wriggle room. Let's move on. If he did his stupid idea, he was touting this as an idea. Why don't you just put the $10 billion directly into housing? Again, no real understanding of like how houses are built. Uh, no understanding that you can't just chuck money at things and hope that the money just like goes into places. It's just this very simple thing of go out, buy houses, build houses, put it all in housing. Because, and I remember him got some expert up saying that housing has projected a higher return on investment than index funds have. Well, you know what would uh, get an even higher return than housing, Pickles? We're going down that logic. Why didn't they just invest the $10 billion in fucking Microsoft shares in 1995 and then sell those those Microsoft shares in 2021 and buy GameStop shares? That would have made way more money than the housing. It's so stupid. It's like putting money in an index fund where you're investing in all of the top performing fields of everything. So there is housing. There's money going into it, into housing. But not just that, you know, the top 200 companies, um, you know, like a bunch of commodity shares, all that stuff. Uh, no, that's stupid. You shouldn't be diversifying your portfolio. Fucking hell. It's like these people really just don't understand the basics of investing. I am not an investment genius by any stretch of the imagination. I'll just pause on that fleeting moment of self-reflection for a second so that we can listen to an actual expert, economist Dr Cameron Murray from the University of Sydney, speaking at the Economics Legislation Committee inquiry held on the HAWF. It looks like Jordan's been trawling through the deep cuts because this wasn't in the original video, it was in one of my older ones. But anyway, here's the clip I'd say he's referring to that poses the crazy question that maybe, just maybe, a housing policy could look at investing in actual housing as opposed to the stock market. Perhaps, rather than giving Costello $10 billion to play around with on the stock market, we just invest that $10 billion in housing. I mean, that sounds simple, right? Is it a crazy idea? Well, it's not as crazy as you might think. I'll start by saying how puzzling it is that considering how obsessed this country is with property investment, the housing policy we've we've come up with to help households being squeezed in rental markets is to not invest in building housing, but spend $10 billion investing in non-housing financial assets instead. I feel like satire and reality have met. In the political comedy show Utopia, there's a scene where Rob Sitch's character explains to a political staffer that building infrastructure today is fixing the future. This is an infrastructure future fund. This is something that sounds good. Exactly. It's like a dream, an aspiration. Then where are we disagreeing? On this. We were going to take money from people in order to build infrastructure, but instead we're going to hang on to it for 20 years in order to build infrastructure. Again, I don't see where we're disagreeing. Why don't we spend it now? Then you won't have a future fund. You've blown it. Jim, Tony, we're talking a major expansion here. Staff, budgets, new board, new building. Sky's the limit. Thinking about the present fixes the future. No, it doesn't. When we get to the future, you're still in the past. What? Whereas a fund is just a risky, expensive and unnecessary waste. The other thing to consider is that houses are assets. 
The New South Wales Land and Housing Commission manages the public housing stock in that state, and the value of its assets went up from $32 billion in 2012 to $51 billion in 2020, a 7.8% compound return. In capital value alone, Australian dwellings increased 7.7% per year in value, net of rental returns since 2006 when the Future Fund was established. What did the Future Fund earn? 7.8% per year return. Had the Future Fund invested directly in building housing in Australia instead of the financial products it did invest in, it probably would have made more money. So perhaps instead of spending tens of millions of dollars a year managing finan and financial fund and doing further research, we could simply pay the Housing Council or the Future Fund Board to be mystery shoppers and go out to the property market and just buy new dwellings, often in bulk, at a good price from private developers in townhouses, apartments or land and house packages. This would put housing equity, an asset, into the fund, increase the rate of new housing construction and immediately grow the pool of housing to allocate to public housing agencies, CHPs or my favourite, by lottery, to non-homeowner households. If you did watch that video, I hope you caught the end of it because it kind of seems relevant here. And if you're a lifelong Labor supporter, you are going to hate this. And your first instinct is to attack someone for trying to push the ALP to be better, well... You need to take a long, hard look at yourself right now. If you're after an idea though, how about this one? If the government truly lacked any real ambition to solve this problem, and were absolutely wedded to the idea of an investment fund, how about instead of borrowing $10 billion, they just transfer $20 billion from the future fund and set up the HAFF with that? They could keep all the other settings the same, the investment mandate, the half a mil annual disbursements. If they'd done it that way, they wouldn't have had to borrow any money and therefore they wouldn't have added to public debt. And the benefit of the $20 billion investment is that it's better equipped to handle $500 million annual disbursements and and still grow. It'd still be a piss weak centerpiece policy, mind you, but it would make more sense financially at least. It is not supposed to address the housing crisis now. It's supposed to alleviate it in the future. Is it though? I mean, cool, let's check in on how the half has alleviated the housing crisis in the future. To be fair, you'll probably find that most peak bodies, particularly those that rely on government funding, publicly support the HAFF, but just how good and vital they view the HAFF is probably best summed up by the submissions from the peak bodies during the bill's consultation phase. The Community Housing Industry Association highlighted that Holy shit. Why would you go to submissions from, look, December 2022, so from last year, submissions to the draft mm. that is like reading the draft of great expectations and thinking well i had great expectations he didn't read the fucking book <laughs> like that is like there's again there's two alternatives here either he is being unbelievably dishonest or he just doesn't understand how parliament works what happens in submissions is the government says, hey, affected bodies, hey, community, we're thinking of passing a law that affects you. Tell us what you think Have about it. Say. Have your say. This is not, I repeat this, this is so important to understand. A draft is not the same as the fucking final legislation that they put up for a bill. It's not even close. It's, it's like... You may as well just be looking at fucking drafts from the 19th century about the post office or something like that. It's just like it has no relevance at all to the final thing that we're talking about here. They're using, he's using that. He's using what they said about the draft. The legislation as drafted provided. Not just using it, that's the best one to use. Don't actually look at the final bill. Don't look at that. Look at the draft. There's so much wrong with what he's saying here that it's really difficult to know where to start. I mean, let's put aside the arrogance for a moment, which I have to say I'm finding progressively harder to ignore the more I watch, and let's just focus on his words. Let's break it down. Why would you go to submissions from, look, December 2022, so from last year, submissions to the draft? Why would someone read submissions to the exposure draft of the HAF bill? Well, background for starters, 
they're a good resource for learning a little bit more about what a wide-ranging bunch of stakeholders actually thought about the bill outside of headlines. Either he is being unbelievably dishonest or he just doesn't understand how Parliament works. What happens in submissions is the government says, hey affected bodies, hey community, we're thinking of passing a law that affects you. Tell us what you think Have about it. Say. Have your say. Now, as to how Parliament works... This is so important to understand. The government drafted the half bill. They then released what is known as the exposure draft, as a consultation step to allow industry stakeholders and the wider community to provide feedback on what the government were proposing to put to Parliament. Stakeholders provided their feedback in the form of their submissions, the things that Jordan's berating me for actually reading. Following that, the government then had the opportunity to make changes to their draft before they tabled their bill in Parliament. I, I repeat this. This is so important to understand. A draft is not the same as the fucking final legislation that they put up for a bill. It's not even close. I'm not sure how to say this, but um, in this case, they're not just close, they're almost identical. Now, this is very important to understand, and I did mention this at the time. The differences between the exposure draft and the version of the bill they first tabled in Parliament were minimal. Like, minimal. Calling them tweaks would really be overstating it. These were minor changes not impacting the substance of the bill at all. You could review both versions yourself. I have reviewed them. I even used this little command to output the differences between the two versions. I was pretty proud of myself. Anyway, it's very safe to say that the version of the bill that stakeholders provided feedback on in December 2022 and January 2023, the exposure draft, is largely the same as what was first tabled in Parliament. So when he's banging on about the exposure draft not even being close to what was first tabled in Parliament, I can't really figure out what he's playing at. You're too kind. You're too generous. Uh, that a draft is the thing that you should be looking at and you're sitting there saying, like, I'm being de deliberately misleading and laying it on a little bit thin. You did, and you're doing it again. Self-reflection is the cornerstone of personal growth. Hey, maybe I should start a self-help channel. Regardless, I think you can work out for yourself why Labor tried to slip this bill through with a $500 million disbursement cap with no minimum spend. If the HA double No, the reason that they did that is because that was on the preliminary and then a bunch of in, uh, investors and advisors came back, including superannuation funds. It had nothing to do with the Greens at all, I found out after, you know, even the video that we did on this before. It really had nothing to do with the Greens at all. And they even used to acknowledge that it had nothing to do with them. It was never any of their demands. It was the demands of a bunch of housing experts, economists, and superannuation funds that were like, put it up to a $500 million minimum cap. That was because of them. They were not trying to slip this through. That was in their draft, where they're just like, what do you think about this? And the experts said, make these changes. And that was one of them. Why did they make those changes? Because they just like looked at it and you know a bunch of fund managers and stuff said yeah I think that we can get like a 500 million dollar return I think that's fine. Yeah so I'm not sure who Jordan found that out from but based on what he's been saying in this video up until this point I'm highly skeptical. Why? Because I read a large slab of the submissions on the draft bill which is where the industry stakeholders including the super companies provided their feedback. I saw big chunks of the public hearings that were held too. I read the committee report and the dissenting reports the most interesting aspect of the committee report was that despite all the feedback and recommendations from stakeholders, the Labor-led committee didn't recommend any changes to the bill at all. The committee just recommended that the bill be passed. Why did the committee report not take on board any of the feedback from the exposure draft? Why was that all left to the dissenting reports of the crossbench? You'd have to say it's because Labor were perfectly happy to ram it through the way it was. I get that, as a Labor man, Jordan will be highly resistant to giving any credit to the crossbench whatsoever, but to suggest that the eventual changes to the bill were a result of consulting with super companies etc, and not a result of months of crossbench pressure is just plain ridiculous. For what it's worth, when the Greens eventually waved through the half bill, albeit in a slightly better state than what Labor would have pushed through had they gotten their way initially, my opinion of the half didn't change. The crossbench were able to force the government to make some improvements, but still overall it's a pretty piss weak housing policy this is the same guy i remember this as well because someone pointed this out i made a joke about max chandler mather in the housing fund uh, video using google calculator to come up with this idea that oh my god this this fund would only if you were building thirty thousand houses 
that would mean that each house would have to cost like $73,000 or some shit. You can't build a house for $73,000. Like, didn't understand how the fund fundamentally worked. Did not understand that main point. Like, just thought that like, I just divide it by 30,000, it's $73,000. Someone pointed this out. Swollen Pickles literally used the fucking computer calculator to get to that number. He did the joke. I, I did not know that when he did that. He did that joke, and this is another thing that he is just completely ignoring by saying, like, oh, it was only 5% substance. A big part of that video, a huge part, was trying to explain how it builds houses at not, like, and, and the idea that it's, like, just $73,000 going into these houses is absolute buckus, just, like, wanton, wanton lies. He was explaining how it gets to that like three hundred thousand dollar mark of building houses, and he just completely ignores that. He has no answer to him being such an idiot that he just divides it on his shitty calculator. Is like, there you go. I'm smarter than everyone. No answer to it. So no, no substantive argument doesn't exist. I would never claim to be smarter than anyone. I do listen though. The government has claimed that the half will be building 30,000 homes in five years. You can't build 30,000 homes within five years spending just $500 million a year. That was my point, which I think in a roundabout way, Jordan's kind of reinforced. The government have been happy to let people run with that line though and make it sound like they're actually building homes. How does a reasonable person interpret this quote attributable to Julie Collins, the housing minister, for example? The Albanese government's ambitious housing agenda also includes establishing the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund, which will build 30,000 new social and affordable rental homes in its first five years. I suspect the average person's going to read that and think, oh cool, the government's going to use the fund to build 30,000 homes in five years. Nice one. I guess though it's probably harder to sell the half if you were to describe it as the government stumping up $500 million a year in subsidies to encourage private investment in social housing to make it easier for capital investors. Anyway, if you've been hearing the government and housing minister talk about how the HAWF will build 30,000 homes and you've assumed that the government are actually building and owning these, then the point is they're not. Actually, that's not entirely true. There would appear to be a few in the Labor Party starting to acknowledge the same. The ACT Labor branch, for example. One or... Is that 22nd of July? 22nd of July. I think that that is before they announced the 500 million. No, that's not correct. The government had agreed to amend the HAWF to guarantee the $500 million minimum spend in early June 2023. The government announced an additional one-off $2 billion in funding for social housing a week or so later, on the 17th of June. The ACT Labor Conference was held over a month later on the weekend of the 22nd of July. It's kind of important due to the gaslighting that's to come. And that little extract that he's talking about there is exactly what I'm talking about. Their main criticism with it is that you should make the $500 million a minimum spend as opposed to a maximum spend, which they adopted. And he's sitting there being like, oh, there's conflict within the party. No, this is the party just having a debate about the draft and coming to a consensus. Right. I guess he's hoping his audience will just accept what he says on face value and is too lazy to rewind to 10 seconds earlier where I'd actually included the screenshot of the resolution carried at the conference. But let's read it together. This conference calls on the Federal Australian Labor Party to commit to ensuring an additional investment at least $2.5 billion per annum into social and affordable housing, whether through a minimum expenditure guarantee from the HAF, direct construction of public housing, or any other suitable method. It calls on the federal government to address the design flaws in the HAWF program by removing the maximum cap on annual expenditures from the fund. So what they're asking for is additional investment of at least $2.5 billion per year into social and affordable housing, as well as removing the cap on annual expenditure from the HAWF. Ultimately, it appears that those at the Labor conference could accept what some people can't. That is that the HAWF just wasn't good enough. For me, this closing line from the resolution's preamble sums things up pretty nicely. The measures proposed by both federal and ACT Labor governments do not take the problem seriously enough, and the community can see it. They're throwing a bucket of water on a bushfire. Uh, and you have to remember, that's from a Labor conference. It's probably a more measured assessment to say that the concept has broad support, although there is almost, outside of the Labor Party at least, a universal view that it's just not good enough and there's room for significant improvements. That's a balanced argument, is it? 
Show me one person that wrote that exact sentence. Because I can show you ones that said the words good and vital, which is how I described it. Yeah, that's a cool story. I'm sure I can find someone to describe the half as vital as well. I've got Google. We're concerned that the negative gearing and capital gains tax changes proposed by the ALP will actually decrease supply because of the double whammy of that policy change. And we're asking for a rethink. Where I couldn't find it though was in the 45 submissions to the exposure draft of the bill. I mean, the word vital did appear across the 45 documents, just not in the context of the HAWF. I think I've gone off track. Anyway, one, I think it was pretty clear that I was providing a summary of the submissions here. And two, having actually read the submissions, and, and that's what I was referring to there, I'm pretty happy with my assessment. The HAWF at the time did have broad support, but there was a fairly universal view that there was some significant scope for improvement. Rather than waste my time pulling together something new, here's the section Jordan's commenting on. You can be the judge then as to whether it's a reasonable assessment or not. To be fair, you'll probably find that most peak bodies, particularly those that rely on government funding, publicly support the HAWF. But just how good and vital they view the HAWF is probably best summed up by the submissions from the peak bodies during the bill's consultation phase. The Community Housing Industry Association highlighted that the legislation as drafted provided insufficient assurances that the HAWF will deliver on its objectives. Furthermore, the HAWF at its current real value will, in all probability, exhaust its potential to fund social and affordable housing beyond the current objectives. And we've got RMIT's Centre for Urban Research saying that the commitment to build 20,000 units of social housing plus 10,000 units of affordable housing in the first five years of the fund is grossly insufficient. And further, that attempting to address this scale of housing insecurity off budget is unrealistic and does not signal a serious government commitment to housing equality. We've got the Property Council of Australia encouraging the government to increase the ambition and scope of its investment. Similar sentiments were echoed by the Master Builders Association. The Urban Development Institute of Australia highlighted that the HAWF had potential, but that it would not deliver on that potential if the HAWF was passed without some significant amendments. They also questioned the government's ability to follow through on the promise of delivering 30,000 homes within five years. Industry Super Australia flagged that the level of investment income may be insufficient, while also flagging that, based on the Queensland experience, the HAWF would fall short of delivering 30,000 homes within five years. The University of Sydney, via the Henry Halloran Trust, made their thoughts on the HAWF fairly clear when they described the HAWF as a bad policy, while pointing out a super fun fact that, that is, that the percentage return on the typical Australian home has exceeded the percentage return on the future fund since its inception in 2006. Their submission also picks up on a theme noted by others and one of the more problematic aspects of the HAWF. The HAWF bill appears to contain little direction on how grants from the HAWF are to be spent. Homelessness Australia highlighted that the HAWF was only a fraction of what was required and like a number of other submissions, they recommended changes to the bill to limit the discretion the Housing Minister had in allocating funding. This is going to come up again later. Another common theme across a large number of the submissions was the criticism that the bill does not define social or affordable housing. The Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute highlighted the potential impact that may have on future reporting as well. In fact, these definitions weren't included in future amendments post-consultation phase which suggests it's a deliberate omission. For what purpose? My guess is it helps shift the goalposts around when it comes to reporting the success of the program in the future. So the HAWF is good and more than that vital? I think that's laying it on a little too thick. It's probably a more measured assessment to say that the concept has broad support, although there is almost, outside of the Labor Party at least, a universal view that it's just not good enough and there's room for significant improvement. An organisation you won't hear a single mention of in the 65 minutes was the CFMEU, or their National Press Club address. You can watch the full address for yourself, I'll put the link in the description, yeah, and if you do, you'll probably it. understand why. As yeah. we sit here today, we are about 750,000 social and affordable dwellings short of where we need to be. It is a gap that's been widening rapidly. In fact, it's 18% wider than it was a decade ago. And even with all that's been promised by governments lately, with all of those initiatives, it will still grow by another 26% by 2041. Given the importance of this problem, we are being way too timid. And I think all of us here know that. And not to nitpick. 
You know what the CFMEU was arguing for? Instead of $10 billion, it should be $20 billion. So he's picking two sentences that, first off, they're not even right about the fact that there's like a need for 750,000 social and affordable dwellings. They're just using that same stat that Max Chandler Mather always used of saying people that are in housing stress, which means they're spending 30% or more on their income on housing, which does not mean that you are fucking homeless and need social and affordable housing. It just means that like most people in a cost of living crisis, you're feeling the pinch. The real number is 122,000. So you pick something, the CFMU is just wrong about that. But then the other thing is, it goes for 22 minutes. And as you can see from what he just did with the draft legislation of picking something you shouldn't pick in the first place and then just picking out paragraphs that suited his argument, I can guarantee you with that 22 minutes that he's just picked two strong statements from them in what is him trying to deliberately elude from the fact that the CFMEU agrees that the half is a good thing, it should just be bigger. That's it. Okay, so here he claims I've misrepresented the CFMEU's press club speech. I really don't think that's true. At the time, I encouraged people to actually go watch the full speech, and I still do. Based on what he said here, I'm not actually sure that Jordan's watched it in full himself. If so, the main point may have eluded him. Okay, so there's a bit to unpack in this one as well. Break it down. Given the importance of this problem, we are being way too timid. And I think all of us here know that. And not to nitpick. You know what the CFMEU was arguing for? Instead of $10 billion, it should be $20 billion. Now that you've heard Jordan speak confidently on the matter, let's take a look at the actual facts. I mean, right from the get-go, it's fairly obvious that Jordan either hasn't watched the CFMEU's National Press Club speech or he's just resorted to making stuff up. This speech is in no way presenting a case that the government should double the size of the half to $20 billion. So today I want to explain why we believe the current housing situation uh, is a unique national crisis and why we need to be so much more ambitious about solving that crisis. And I also want to present to you an independently researched proposal from Oxford Economics Australia on how we can fix it. Zach Smith's speech was around housing, framed around the report the CFMEU had commissioned from Oxford Economics, and involved presenting the CFMEU's plan to radically shape up the approach and funding towards social housing via a super profits tax. The CFMEU's plan was looking to raise some $500 billion via a super profits tax in order to address the social housing shortfall by 2041. For what it's worth, I had posted the full clip in a previous video in response to a short eight second grab that I'd seen shared widely online, and we'll get to that. So he's picking two sentences that, first off, they're not even right about the fact that there's like a need for 750,000 social and affordable dwellings. They're just using that same stat that Max Chandler Mather always used of saying people that are in housing stress, which means they're spending 30% or more on their income, on housing, which does not mean that you are fucking homeless and need social and affordable housing. It just means that like most people in a cost of living crisis, you're feeling the pinch. The real number is 122,000. So you pick something, the CFMEU is just wrong about that. Phew, it's not just me that's wrong. Apparently the CFMEU are wrong too. The CFMEU were referencing the figure provided by Oxford Economics in their report. The forecasts that Oxford Economics used, as they point out, are broadly in line with the NHFIC as well as the University of New South Wales research. Jordan prefers to refer to a smaller number. Classic climate sceptic move. But then the other thing is, It goes for 22 minutes. The speech goes for around 37 minutes, then about 25 minutes worth of generally unrelated questions at the end. But please continue. And as you can see from what he just did with the draft legislation of picking something you shouldn't pick in the first place and then just picking out paragraphs that suited his argument, I can guarantee you with that 22 minutes that he's just picked two strong statements from them in what is him trying to deliberately elude from the fact that the CFMEU agrees that the half is a good thing, it should just be bigger. That's it. Yeah, nah, I really didn't. Here's the full unedited clip, I've actually featured it before as I said. People latched on to this one singular reference to the HAWF in what was a 37 minute speech, as if this were some glowing endorsement. The Federal Government has obviously laid out the Housing Australia Future Fund, which we do believe Parliament should pass as soon as possible. Victoria has the Big Housing Build Program, Queensland has the Housing Investment Fund. There's the Together Home Transition Program in New South Wales and the growing and renewing public housing program right here in the ACT. And these are all worthy, positive initiatives. But let's get this clear. They are nowhere near sufficient to close the gap. 
Given the importance of this problem, we are being way too timid. And I think all of us here know that. Now, if you do watch the speech, the whole speech, and pay attention, the underlying message from that speech is both important and quite telling. That the CFMEU think the HAWF should have been passed is almost a throwaway acknowledgement at the start of the 37-minute speech. If that's all you take away, you've missed the far bigger and more important point. I'll spell it out. The key takeaway from this speech is that despite what federal and state governments have promised, which includes the HAWF, it's nowhere near enough. To address a problem as large as housing in this country, it's going to require a far bigger and bolder plan. That's the key message. So what did they find? Well, for a start, they confirmed that even with all those new programs I just mentioned, factored in, we're not going to come close to closing the gap. As we sit here today, we are about 750,000 social and affordable dwellings short of where we need to be. It is a gap that's been widening rapidly. In fact, it's 18% wider than it was a decade ago. And even with all that's been promised by governments lately, with all of those initiatives, it will still grow by another 26% by 2041. So what do we need to do to close the gap? Well, Oxford Economics finds we would need to build about 52,600 dwellings a year between now and 2041. Theoretically, we could do this faster and hit the target quicker, but there are constraints on construction capacity, land release and so on. So 2041 is a feasible target. And if we operate on that time frame, and if we factor in how the cost of construction is expected, to increase over the forecast period, we will need an investment of $511 billion between now and 2041. That is half a trillion dollars. Now, needless to say, $511 billion is real money. So let's get utilitarian. How can you raise $511 billion while causing the least amount of suffering? The answer to us is clear, a super profits tax. <laughs> Oxford Economics, our research, calculates revenue from an economy-wide super profits tax could raise $290 billion over the next decade, and considerably more in the decade after that. That would comfortably fund the investment required to close the social and affordable housing gap by 2041. And as you can see from what he just did with the draft legislation of picking something you shouldn't pick in the first place and then just picking out paragraphs that suited his argument, I can guarantee you with that 22 minutes that he's just picked two strong statements from them. I mean, that's absolutely not something Jordan would ever do, right? Look, I have to admit I'm starting to wonder at this point, was this all just projection on his behalf? Look, I'll cut it here because quite frankly this video has gone on long enough as it is and I'm really only scratching the surface. The reality is I probably would have just plain ignored his original video had he not spoken about the HAWF as if it was some grand visionary plan. Here's an example. Only the beginning of Labor's policy, mind you, which, let's be honest, is very ambitious, very comprehensive, visionary visionary. This is unbelievably forward thinking. It's not. It's just not any of those things. So let's cut the crap. The HAWF is an investment fund set up by the government with borrowed money and a small portion of the fund will be distributed each year to vaguely support the delivery of housing. That's the reality of what the HAWF is. Now it's my opinion, and I'm probably not alone here, that in its current iteration, it's going to do next to nothing to address the underlying housing problem in Australia. It's the very definition of a better than nothing policy. I reckon Jordan knows that. I said this in the earlier video and probably half a dozen times since. Setting up an investment fund in and of itself is fine. It has its place. But when you're pitching this as the centerpiece of your housing policy, and you know how big the problem is and how much it will grow by over the next 10 years. It's not good enough. The reality is that by the time this fund has been able to build to the point that it can actually put a decent dent in the problem, the horse will have well and truly bolted. Look, I don't expect Jordan to come out and start being critical of Labor and Labor policies. I have to say though, it'd make for some interesting viewing if he decided to start going after Labor even half as hard as he does the Coalition, the Greens or anyone else he doesn't like. 
but I'm not sure he's really in a position to do that. I know that I'm far from perfect. I'm just one guy. I do this in my spare time when I feel like it. I dig into issues that interest me, pour over as much information as I can, and then I share my thoughts. I'm not running a business here. If I lose a bunch of subscribers, sure, it's a bummer and gets me further away from my ultimate goal. It will be mine. Oh yes, it will be mine. But that's it. It's not the end of the world. But for Jordan, this is a business, and it's a fairly lucrative one, it seems. And his is a business model built up over a number of years off the back of attacking anyone that's not the Labor Party. He has a habit of making things personal and creating controversy, which is, let's be honest, what gets the clicks. And when you're running a business off the back of YouTube, it's all about the clicks and the Patreon. He's kind of wedged himself, really. Hypothetically, of course, what do you think happens if he were to go even half as hard at Labor as he does anyone he doesn't like? Do you think it's more or less likely that ALP pollies would be happy for a sit-down interview? Do you think the congratulatory messages would roll on in? I will preface this with as soon as I started going after the Australian Unemployment Workers' Union, a lot of heavyweights within the Labor movement who I can't disclose, <coughs> Bill Shorten Stafford, but there was, <laughs> but there was, there was others. There was, there was others as well. But uh, a lot of them were messaging me and just online saying, "Thank you for going after these clods." <laughs> What do you think happens to the subscriber count when the rusted on ALP voters start hearing things that they don't really want to hear? Maybe he loses subscribers or worse. Patreons. As an aside, from what I've learned personally on a relatively small scale, is that rusted on voters are a fickle bunch. They'll get behind you so long as you're pumping up the tyres of their team and sinking the boot into the opposition. But if you dare say anything remotely critical of their team, well, they'll... Disappear faster than a mule can shit itself. Okay, well, not what I had in mind originally, but you get the point. What is original housing fund video, as well as this podcast show, is that Jordan has a massive blind spot when it comes to labour. Don't get me wrong, there have been times when Jordan has brought attention to things that people may otherwise not have noticed, but for me, it seems pretty clear through a lot of what he has said that he hasn't looked at the HAWF at all critically. So I have to ask, is that standard for his content? It's okay to expect a higher standard from the current Labor government. Just because we're coming off the back of a coalition government that was, let's face it, one of the worst governments we've seen in many, many years, that doesn't mean that we need to set the bar low now. In this instance, I don't actually know what upset him more, the criticism of a Labor policy or the fact that someone was actually taking a look at the substance of what he was saying rather than just fanboying him. There was a bunch of stuff here I basically cut for time and it wasn't super relevant. But I'll just say this, at the end of the day, people will make up their own minds. What I've learned is that there are people that think Jordan walks on water, but from what I've seen, he's just a guy with opinions. He can be right and wrong about things just like anyone else. To be honest, this whole thing has left me feeling a little bit meh. And if anything, it's been a lesson to me in what it feels like to be proper gaslit. So there's that. <laughs>